Good evening. I call the April 5th, 2018 meeting of the uh, Board of Commissioners for the City of Johnson City to order tonight. Uh, we want to uh, welcome all the people who are watching on live stream and on TV and for those who are in the chambers with us tonight. We hope you will see your government at work. Uh, this evening, um, Commissioner Fowler is going to do our invocation if we can all rise and stay standing for our pledge. Uh, let us pray. Lord, we just come to you and just thank you so much for everything you do for us. Uh, we ask you to be with us tonight and lead us and guide us in what we should do. We thank you for this town, uh, this city of Johnson City, and just thank you for all the residents here and let us do good for them and what we do. Lord, we just uh, thank you for our country and be with our leaders. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Peterson, before we start tonight, I think we're going to make a couple adjustments to the agenda. Um, our first item will be, um, let me get down to it, uh, a street closure for zooming in the mountains for someone who has to be at work. And then secondly, we're going to have the presentation by um, Net reps uh, talking about our economic development. If that's okay with the commissioners? Okay, okay Mr. Peterson. All right, this is a street closure request from Zooming in the Mountains to accommodate the Shine and Show block party to be held on Saturday, June the 9th. This is a request to close a portion of East Main Street from 10 a.m. until 4 p.m. Uh, all the reviews have been made, and the recommendation is for approval of the request. We have the applicant come forward. State your name and address, please. Uh, yes, ma'am. My name is Lori Haggerty, 209 Springview Drive, Great Tennessee. And we are excited about bringing Zoom in the Mountains Incorporated to downtown Johnson City for the first time in the 12 years that we've done this event. We are raising money for Speedway Children's Charity with Bristol Motor Speedway. Over the past 11 years, we've given over $140,000 to this event. This is a very simple event that we would like to do downtown Johnson City, just bringing our Miata, Mazda Miata enthusiasts to our area to simply showcase downtown, enjoy our restaurants and our businesses, and of course to show off their cars and to win some awards. So again, it's uh, on June the 9th from uh, 10 to 4, and uh, we would really like to uh, bring those folks here with the approval. So you, they will be parking their cars on Main Street, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. We will park the cars there to showcase. We'll have a shine and show there and just uh, have people out uh, looking to see what all these uh, folks enjoy about their cars and enjoy about coming to our area. And um, how many cars do you think will be down there? Well, we are expecting close to 250 participants, so it all depends on how many people we get in the show. Of course, we're going to try to park as many as we can down Main Street in the allotted area. Now, you were in town last year, though, weren't you? Yes, ma'am. I know. I thought we, I came we were in to here you. down in the fall. We were here in the fall. We right. come down and done a little uh, stop in in Johnson City, but we've never actually held and put a lot of emphasis right downtown. So that's that's what we want to do this year. Well, we're, th we're thrilled that you see it in that light that you want to have your event here. Commissioners, do you have any other questions? Move approval. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Ms. Jennings, did you call the roll? Commissioner Fowler? Yes. Commissioner yes. Commissioner Wise? Yes. Vice Mayor Brock? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Your next order of business will be a presentation by Mitch Miller as an update on the activities of NetRep. Thank you all for your flexibility to, um, we're hosting an event tonight called Talent Connect. Uh, you all may be familiar with that, I've actually been part of it and participated as well, um, where we bring in college students, uh, specifically junior, senior level students, looking to get a, looking to get introduced to job opportunities with some of our top employers like General Shell, um, A.O. Smith, Mullican Flooring, and others. So that is actually going on tonight. We're doing a culinary tour of downtown Johnson City. So that's why um, I appreciate your flexibility so I can go out and have some really great food and, and get, you know, have a good time. So thank you all for that. And you're welcome to join us if you get out of here at a decent hour tonight. So um, a little bit about what we're up to. Um, we were here Monday night to provide a uh, kind of more detailed um, 
presentation, but Commissioner Wise, Commissioner Van Brocklin, I know that you cannot attend Monday. If you have any specific questions, please stop me throughout the presentation. I'm happy to, to answer those. But we're doing things a little different with Talent Connect. Uh, this year we'll be doing two events, the local portion focused on ETSU, Milligan College, King University in Tusculum and Northeast State. It's taking place tonight and we'll have one in the fall we'll focus more on about a five hour drive radius around uh, Johnson City where we're bringing in Tennessee Tech, UT, Virginia Tech, uh, USC and, and others as well. But the idea in the program is really centered around trying to attract talent into this area and getting them acclimated with what it's like to be a young professional here and actually experience not just working here, but the outdoors and what it's like to play here, what it's like to go out and, you know, enjoy some of the restaurants, tapping in with some of our young professional networks and groups as well. So it's a great event. Um, we've had a lot of great success from that as well with a lot of our employers also. A little bit of industrial activity that we have going on. Um, some great news happened today, which I'll talk a little bit um, in the next couple slides about the Washington County Industrial Park. but. As you know, we've had two uh, sites out there that we've been working on to get pad ready. Uh, those projects are completed and there's been a lot of activity and interest on those sites. Um, together, uh, looking at new and existing projects, we have eight active projects. And when I classify active, those are folks that have actually stepped into Johnson City or Washington County toward the site and really have an interest in the site. So out of those eight active projects that are new companies looking here about 381 million in capital investment and 1600 new jobs and then from an existing standpoint with some of our local employers that are considering major expansions uh, there's four active projects here in washington county focused on about 50 million in investment and 400 jobs what i think is really unique about the activity that we're seeing um, and this is really on the corporate side of things all the interest that you're seeing in downtown um, and i think allied dispatch really kind of started that movement uh, from the private sector side and they've since started on their project and are underway we've got we've got a couple one in particular that's a, a pretty significant project looking at downtown johnson city that would be corporate level jobs what what it really comes down to uh, a lot of it is what you as a commission have been able to do in investing in things like founders park what you're doing on walnut street so i'm certainly appreciative of that and thank you for your hard work and commitment to downtown on that uh, one of the things I also want to talk about, um, and it's great, some folks from ETSU are here. Uh, we've got a great partnership with our university. And also there's a regional industrial development group uh, that Alan Bridwell runs called the RIDA. And for a few years, we've been partnered up on a soft landings program where we've used the Innovation Lab kind of as, as a soft landing spot for international companies that don't have a U.S. presence. So we were able a few years ago to actually target a company called FWG. They were based in Germany convinced them that Johnson City would be a great place to have their first U.S. sales office as they look to try to get contracts in the U.S. They landed in the innovation lab, spent about a year to year and a half there, and uh, as they grew and actually got contracts, wound up uh, purchasing a facility in South Johnson City uh, near Rolling Hills Drive. So they've been in up there. Um, they've expanded a little bit with the purchase of the property, adding some new employees, and they're actually going to be looking to do production within the next year. And one of the great other stories that we've had happen this this past year, we had an agreement with a, another group right outside Dusseldorf called Hebenmuller. And they have uh, since signed a lease to go into the innovation lab as well. And we're hoping the same process kind of follows suit where we can get ahead of what a traditional curve of economic development is where a company looking to establish in the state of Tennessee calls Nashville. And we have 95 counties total in Nashville, uh, in, uh, in Tennessee that will be under consideration and they're likely to call South Carolina and North Carolina and Georgia in the process as well. So what we're doing here is really trying to take a proactive entrepreneurial approach to get ahead of them actually calling the state, a consultant, whatever it may be, and building our relationships uh, person to person. And we've seen some great success and um, without FWG, we never would have been introduced to Hebmuller and we're hoping that that much more happens because of these introductions. From a site development standpoint, um, just announced today, the state of Tennessee uh, designated uh, the 21 acre site out in the Washington County Industrial Park as a certified site. Basically, that's a pretty lengthy process where we have to answer a ton of questions uh, tied to environmental work, utilities, uh, anything that any consultant would ask. It's basically getting our homework done to turn in. So we're prepared for that investment to come here and move that much faster. Um, all the work is done out at the Washington County Industrial Park. We partnered up with our, uh, our um, community partners down in Unicoi County, and recently uh, they uh, were awarded a half million dollar grant to go on a 16 acre site called the, where the Morgan Installation property was. It's since been cleared and actually will be graded out for a 150,000 square foot pad as well. 
which I think will really lead to a lot of opportunity for job creation for folks in this region also. And then this is the part that I always find the most interesting and fun because it involves the outdoors. Um, Commissioner Brock is part of our outdoor task force, but we've got a lot of really good things going on. I know that we recently announced uh, the Meet the Mountains Festival, and one of the unique things about that, um, beyond it taking place in Founders Park is Base Camp in Johnson City. Blue Ridge Outdoor Magazine um, just committed to actually come up and actually cover the event and be like a uh, um, on-site, uh, kind of like our guest of uh, the festival, and actually they're going to be writing about it in their magazine. So I'm really, really excited about that because it's going to get folks here to see what we're doing with the festival, really get engaged with the area, and we're making it a point that we get them up to Tannery Knobs and we put them on a bike so they can see some of the things that we're doing in this region as a whole. And um, some of the things our group has been focused on uh, that we'll be talking about in more detail on April 30th at our upcoming meeting is really looking at a master planning effort. Uh, and when I say master planning, it's not just three counties that we represent. We really have to take a broader look at this. We have to look at parts of Western North Carolina, all of Northeast Tennessee, and really up into Southwest Virginia as well. Figure out ways that we can connect some of these assets that we have that make this place special, whether it be the Creeper Trail, Tannery Knobs, or the Appalachian Trail and look at ways that we can enhance our assets uh, as a way to attract talent and really get tourism numbers up here as well. So I'm excited where we're going with that. And if there's not any other questions, I'm gonna turn it over to Diana. Talk about downtown. So we are, um, obviously you've had a lot of requests for street closures or um, um, event requests and so we are gearing up to festival and event season it starts um, tomorrow evening with Corazon Latino Festival in Founders Park and then um, almost every weekend through um, October there is something going on downtown so we're really excited to welcome the region to our downtown um, the first event in King Commons will be April 21st um, that's the wrong date for a farmer's market. They've actually decided to wait and open April 28th, and I think you'll see some significant changes in our farmer's market, and I'm really excited about that. Um, Founders After Five kicks off May 11th, and Instacrafty, which is part of our Downtown Strong Micro Enterprise grant that we got, will begin on May 20th, and that is a maker's market to really help build the creative class that we have in Johnson City in this region and help them um, take their craft to a, um, a sustainable income. And so um, that first one will be Sunday, May 20th. They will be from 12 to 6. We will have another one in July and then one in September. We're really excited about the startup space that you all have given us the opportunity to use. We've put about $4,000 in structural and some um, new air conditioning, new drywall, some, real, some great improvements in that space. Um, and we have, um, the committee will meet next week, but they will choose a, um, a business to go in there. And I'm really excited about the ones that have applied. There were some pretty strict qualifications, and um, there were a couple of business um, that didn't meet the qualifications and then some others that were really interested but just weren't ready in June so if given the opportunity on another space I think we can um, fill that as well so we're excited about the startup space how many did you have apply there was really only two qualified applicants okay. um, and the main thing was the the start date the open date of June was a little bit of a challenge for some so like I said I think there's if we were given the opportunity for another space we um, we would have more applicants and we could um, but you have support okay. programs to help them start small businesses yes were the ones who didn't qualify are yes they and, and actually um, one of the applicants um, actually called back and said take it off I've actually um, in, are about I'm about to enter into a lease downtown so um, there's several from our co-starter class that um, out of 12 co-starters I believe three have already entered into leases downtown to open new businesses and then that's not counting what we can do in the startup space so it's exciting um, and then each one of you will be um, called by a member of the JCDA and um, Mr. Peterson and Ms. Jennings, they've already put a date on your calendar as well um, to talk about a central business improvement district. Over the last um, couple of months, we have had um, about five meetings with some really key downtown property owners, and um, we will have two public meetings. 
Friday, April 13th at 2 p.m. and then Tuesday, April 17th at 6 p.m. Letters went out to every commercial property owner to invite them to this meeting and, um, and we are just really um, excited about the direction of this and how well it has been received so far by the property owners. And, um, and so we will be, um, the JC, like I said, the JCDA members will be meeting with all of you all to talk about this um, project as well as some, um, a couple of other things that we have um, on the agenda or some concerns that we have. So a lot going on downtown Johnson City. Are there any questions uh, before Ms. Cantler leaves us? Oh, you're staying, okay. <laughs> well, I can remember just a couple of years ago, us sitting up here saying we wanted, you know, a lot more events downtown, and so you've delivered. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Mitch. Your next order of business will be consideration of the minutes of your meeting held on Thursday, March 22nd. Commissioners, are there any changes to the minutes from our last meeting? Okay, I have a motion. Move for approval. Second. Ms. Jennings? Commissioner Fowler. Yes. Commissioner Debron. Yes. Commissioner Wise. Yes. Brock. Yes. At this time, I'd like to ask Pat Walding and members of the Trend Appearance Board to come forward for the presentation of a proclamation recognizing Arbor Day. Thank you, and gentlemen, thank you for coming tonight. This is this is a great honor to be able to read this resolution. I can remember as a child growing up in Johnson City, I climbed a lot of trees, <laughs> and so um, I have a, a great affinity for them. I think my husband does not, though, when he has to rake them in our yard. But it's a great honor to read this proclamation. Whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. And whereas Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world. And whereas Johnson City recognizes that trees contribute to the community's beautification, economic vitality, increased property values, and improved quality of life. And whereas the city of Johnson City has been designated a Tree City USA by the National Arbor Day Foundation for its 18th consecutive year. Now therefore, I, on behalf of our Mayor David Tamita um, and our Commission for the City of Johnson City do hereby proclaim April 7th, 2018 as Arbor Day. So y'all can clap now. <laughs> Pat, you wanna say a few words? Thank you. I've, uh, first of all, I'd like to um, have these guys, these are members of our Tree and Appearance Board, our Tree and Landscape Boards, pardon me. I'd like to go ahead and introduce yourself. Chase Gibner, uh, member of the board. Tom Terry, member of the board. I'm Ken, I'm Ken Sorgel, mem member of the board. And I'm Pat Walding, I'm, I'm a staff, city forester. Um, I like to use this time, because we, we are celebrating Arbor Day this Saturday, and one of the things we do at, for the last eight years is give away tree seedlings. And we've given over 22,000 to date. Um, this event will be this Saturday at nine o'clock at Metro Kiwanis Park. Uh, and we, the trees we have this year, we have eight of them, uh, are Trident Maple, Redbud, Dogwood, Southern, uh, Sweet Bed Magnolia, Nut All Oak, Bald Cypress, American Hornbeam, Dwarf, Red Buckeye. And they're, they're there while quantities last, and we usually uh, tell people they can have one, one tree per species. So. And would you repeat again where in the time? This is Metro Aquinas, uh, this Saturday, the 7th, at 9 o'clock. Metro Aquinas, for those who yeah. not recognize the name, is <laughs> It's at the corner of Garanda Drive and Knob Creek. Yeah. Rain or shine. <laughs> and thank you all for serving on the Tree and Appearance Board. Um, uh, citizens serve on the boards for Johnson City to advise the City Commission, and we appreciate it very much. So who wants to take this? Very good. Thank Thanks a lot. Mayor, Commissioners, our next item of business is a presentation by Dr. Debbie Bird and Aaron Scott regarding the ETSU Gatton College of Pharmacy and its significant impact on our community and the region.
Um, I want to begin by sharing a little bit of history for those of you who may not be familiar with how um, ETSU's Gatton College of Pharmacy began um, over a decade ago. Back in 2005, there was a significant pharmacist shortage in the country and in this region in particular, and there was only one college of pharmacy in the state over 500 miles away. Um, at that time, the state of Tennessee was unable to support the college financially, uh, and the governor at the time, Phil Bredesen, challenged this community to raise $5 million in 90 days uh, to be allowed to begin the College of Pharmacy. Um, and this community raised $5 million in 58 days. And the city commission was a major supporter of us financially, and we wouldn't be here without you. So the primary purpose of this presentation today is just to say thank you. So I worked with um, the College of Business and Technology at East Tennessee State University, Dr. John Smith, to prepare an economic impact analysis. Um, there was a, a preliminary analysis completed before the college began, but uh, based on projected numbers, so we finally have actual data to input. Uh, just some basic information. Um, essentially, we look at employment, labor income, and value added, and overall output. And those are defined as employment FTE jobs um, at the college, labor income, more overall labor, value added, uh, some of several different types of income, and then the output is the overall sum of those things. And I'm going to share that information uh, for several different inputs. This is just a graphic of this, which was important for me to understand how this works. Uh, direct spending of the college, um, you know, goes goes to our particular employees and money that we spend just to get our work done, uh, but then some of that money goes to businesses in the community to help us get that work done. And then uh, those folks spend income, our employees and students spend money while they're here, and that relates to some induced effects. Some of the baseline metrics as we worked on this back in 2017 were revenues at the college of $11 million, and that's primarily tuition. Um, 58 employees, uh, spending primarily for salaries for faculty and staff, over 300 students enrolled, um, estimating that students spend about $23,000 a year just to live, um, and they brought in over 1,000 visitors who then spend money while they're here, um, and we're currently engaged with the Academic Health Science Center in constructing, um, actually renovating a building on the VA campus, uh, Building 60, that will be a new Interprofessional Education and Research Center. So there are some construction impacts last year and this year. Uh, that project will be complete in July, and we're excited about that opening as well. So looking specifically at the direct college operations and how that has impacted the economy, uh, you can see specifically here, I'm just gonna focus on the bottom line primarily that that direct um, college operations impact to the economy in the, in the bottom right hand corner is over $21 million a year um, and 127 um, jobs created. Looking at that student spending, that $23,000 a year that students spend just to live here, that translates to over $13 million each year and 119 jobs created in the community. The visitors that come to see our students for events and over the weekend, um, having a place to stay is over a half a million dollars each year and six jobs. And if you look at the overall, put all those things together, the annual economic impact of Gatton College of Pharmacy is over $36 million a year for the state of Tennessee. And the largest portion of that, $29 million, stays regionally here in this area. Looking at the future, um, that's gonna increase over time. And you all have a copy of our report, the economic impact report that shows over the next decade that the economic impact will reach about $380 million. As John Smith and I worked on this, I kept asking him, well, what about this and what about that for things that weren't included? So I'm gonna share that. That's not included in the, th the 36 million. Um, but he was very conservative in his analysis. Uh, some of the things are tax collections uh, that, of course, benefit the community, state and local taxes of $1.3 million, over $3 million in federal taxes. Those construction impacts that I mentioned in 2017, almost $6 million uh, contributed. And then this year, we'll have almost $5 million contributed to the economy and several jobs. 
so for the last two years and just for the tax collections on that construction alone, uh, you can see it's several hundred thousand dollars. So the full economic impact because of that construction um, is actually been $46 million for 2017 and 2018. Another piece that wasn't included was the impact of having pharmacy graduates. A pharmacist mean income, median income is about $122,000 and, and they go out and spend money. And so that affects the um, community to the, to the tune of $183,000 uh, for each of those pharmacists that graduate. I also want to share some non-dollar values with you and, and just to let you know what your investment um, has created for students. Our admissions report, um, these are our current classes, the class of 2018 that's counting down the days, so they'll graduate in May. Um, you can see some of their statistics there. Um, very strong quality students that we've had over the years. We've had no difficulty um, attracting students and we graduate about 75 students, 75 to 80 students each year. There is a negative trend nationwide for pharmacy school applications. Um, over the last several years and this year, last year to this year, they're down about 25% nationally. However, our applications are up 31% uh, compared to just last year. And you can see that comparison admission cycle. We also have some data um, about our region in the southeast, looking at all the colleges and schools of pharmacy in the southeastern United States. The average number of applications that they've received is 200. And you can see we have nearly 600 applications. So this is a program that's highly sought after. Do we know why the applications nationally are down? You know, we wish we knew exactly why. Um, and we don't have those answers yet. Um, you know, there was a significant shortage several years ago, and, and I think there was a lot of discussion about that. Um, you know, our graduates are still getting jobs. 96% within three months of graduation have a job. That's not necessarily the case for all graduates from all programs, so I think there's a little bit of hesitation in making that investment without that guarantee that used to be there that you'll have a job. Um, you know, there's been conjecture that other health professions as, as their salaries have, have increased if they only require two years of education to be able to, to work versus the four-year program that we require um, could be a detriment as well. But we think one of the things that we can do is just let potential students know all the opportunities that are available career-wise for students. Um, I know whenever I was growing up, I wasn't thinking I want to be a pharmacist when I grow up. That just wasn't something that uh, was at the top of my mind. So I think we can do a better job as a profession of sharing um, the impact that we have on healthcare. Um, you can see where our students come from. Um, if I could draw a radius, the vast majority are from right here um, in this region, Kentucky, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia, about 80%. Uh, but we draw nationwide as well. About 20% come from all over the country. We're really excited about that last row there, the uptick in students from ETSU. We've had some significant outreach efforts to the undergraduate side of campus, and we're excited to see more of those students staying with us. Um, another important statistic that I want to share is that almost half of our students are first generation college students and that's very unusual for a professional program. So just thinking about the impact for those families over the long term as first generation students of, of what they'll be able to do in their lives. Um, a third are from rural zip codes. We ask students uh, whenever they come to how many of you is Johnson City a, a small town and about half raise their hand and we say for how many of you is Johnson City a big city and the other half raise their hand. Uh, so we have some folks from some very rural areas just very successful in terms of our outcomes. Um, they come from all over the country um, and even across the world. We only require two years of prerequisites, but over half of them come to us with a degree. Um, and, and again, you can just see that they come from, from all over and we're just very proud to be able to share with you their accomplishments. Another focus for our students is their service and giving back to the community. Um, and I know you can't read all this, but they give back a lot. They've been recognized nationally for that. Um, 
this was a national competition last year that our students won for the second time, uh, the ACCP, American College of Clinical Pharmacy, Clinical Pharmacy Challenge. Um, and it's almost 140 colleges and schools of pharmacy in the country compete, um, and our students won. And only one other college has won that competition twice. So we're very, very proud um, of their abilities. And then just last month, they were named for the fourth time in a row national champions for the American Pharmacists Association Academy of Student Pharmacists Generation <laughs> RX group. And that's the group that focus, focuses on educating uh, people of all ages about prescription drug abuse and misuse, which is very important to our region as well. And so again, I'm just here to let you know um, what you've created by your support, and thank you for that. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about the college. Commissioners, anyone have any comments or questions? Just a curiosity question. Do you have the capacity for additional class size or students, and if so, how much? You know, we're, we're limited in that respect. Um, we, our class size officially is 80. We could potentially increase by maybe, maybe five to 10 at the most, but that's not our goal. Um, obviously, obviously that would change some of the numbers that we just talked about. Um, however, having a small class size is a lot of um, who we are and the support that we're able to give our students and the experience that they have. We really take good care of them. Um, and that's different than some larger programs. So um, that's not one of our goals to increase our class size. Something that we are working on um, that we want to share. I mentioned initially there's no, no support from the state and we've gotten no support from the state since we began. But there's actually a couple of budget amend amendments in Nashville right now where we're asking for um, dollars to support students. Um, it would go to the Tennessee Higher Education Commission um, to create a scholarship program for students who would like to attend ETSU Gatton College of Pharmacy and it closes the tuition gap between ETSU and the University of Tennessee because we're privately funded. Our tuition is at a private funding level and the difference is about $15,000 a year for our students. Um, and you know, the, the distance in terms of accessibility and just the different experience that they have is really too much for many students. So um, we hope that that's successful this year or next year um, in terms of giving our students a choice. While you've started that, why don't you go on to explain why that tuition is less at the state funded school in terms of the discount to out-of-state students. Absolutely, I'll be happy to. Yeah, I think it's really important it is. that this community mm -hmm. understands the uh, playing field that you all are playing in right now. Certainly, um, and, and we as a college are competing very successfully, but our concern is for Tennesseans and Tennessee taxpayers having a choice. Um, I mentioned the difference in tuition for uh, students who go to ETSU versus University of Tennessee is $15,000 per year. Last year, the University of Tennessee College of Pharmacy began offering a tuition discount program to students that live within a 200 mile radius of their Memphis, Nashville, or Knoxville campuses. Um, and that may not seem like a lot, but it actually encompasses 14 surrounding states. And those students, the tu tuition discount is 75% off the out of state tuition differential, which means that a student from Alabama can attend the University of Tennessee College of Pharmacy and pay $10,000 less per year than an East Tennessean who pays taxes and currently supports the University of Tennessee College of Pharmacy uh, pays to attend ETSU Gatton College of Pharmacy. So it's really the point that taxpayers in this area, you saw where our students come from, um, they're paying into the system and now they're supporting students from other states to use state funded resources and we feel like that's that's unfair to students even though we're we're being successful in terms of recruiting despite that difference well, dr. bird I think I can speak on everyone's behalf that uh, anytime we talk about uh, East Tennessee State University we talk with great pride that we have a, a college of pharmacy a school of pharmacy so the effectiveness of it brought you here so we're glad about that and so anytime we can help the university grow and, and this is for the public 
um, it, it is economic development because we have, as you said, 70 or 58 faculty and staff who may have not been here before and all the number of students who have come through this curriculum. So it's, it's good for everyone. So congratulations. And how long have you been here now? Not quite two years. Not quite two years, but you love it, right? <laughs> I do love it. <laughs> My great. family loves it as well. Well, thank but you for sharing this with us. Thank you, and thank you again for your support. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> but the next order of business is consideration of license. The first being consider a certificate of compliance application for Hal Sherrod Jr. Creekside Package Store doing business as Parkway Discount Wine and Liquor. Uh, the appropriate reviews have been made, finding no disqualifying factors. The recommendation is for approval. And I would remind you that the certificate of compliances are a cursory review to ensure that there, we find no disqualifying factors. There is no approval granted by the commission to the applicant. And we did agree that the applicant did not need to be here to the previous commission. So do we need a motion to approve? Yes, you will. Yeah. Move approval. Second. Any further discussion? Ms. Jennings? Yes. 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 Your next certificate of appliance application is for James Edward Hyatt running the KVAT Food Stores Incorporated Food City Store number 601. The appropriate reviews having been made, finding no disqualifying factors, the recommendation is for approval. Motion? So moved. Second. Right. Any further discussion? Ms. Jennings? Yes. 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 Next is a certificate certificate of compliance application for Derek Allen Atkinson, operating KVAT Food Stores number six twenty nine. The appropriate reviews have been made, finding no disqualifying factors. The recommendations for approval. Move approval. Second. Any further discussion? Ms. Jennings. Commissioner Fowler. Yes. 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 Next is a consideration of a certificate of compliance application for Annalise Marie Brown operating KVAP food store number 641. The appropriate reviews have been made, finding no disqualifying factors. The recommendation is for your approval. Move approval. Second. We're doing some great work here tonight. <laughs> I think, you know. <laughs> Any further discussions? Ms. Jennings. Commissioner Fowler. We are yes. on fire. <laughs> Yes. Brock. Yes. Uh, these are for wine in, in the food stores. In the food cities stores. Mm -hmm. Next is consider a certificate of compliance application for Dale Eugene Hammett operating KVAP food store number 670. The appropriate reviews have been made, finding no disqualifying factors. The recommendation is for approval. Move approval. Second. Any further discussion? Ms. Jennings. Mr. Fowler. Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Consider a certificate of compliance application for Terry Wayne Templeton operating KVAT food store number 699. The appropriate reviews have been made, finding no disqualifying factors. The recommendations for your approval. Move approval. Second. Any further discussion? Ms. Jennings? Commissioner Fowler? Yes. Commissioner Brock? Yes. Commissioner Wise? Yes. Vice Mayor Brock? Yes. Your next item of consideration is consideration of a temporary occasion license for the Blue Plum organization to sell beer uh, on June 1st and June 2nd at the Blue Plum event to be held at Founders Park. The appropriate reviews have been made and the recommendation is for approval. State your name and address, please. Caroline Abercrombie, 117 West 11th Avenue. And have you read the rules and regulations concerning the sale and serving of beer in our city? I have. And you agree to abide by them? I do. Okay. Commissioners, any questions? Okay. Do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. <laughs> any further discussion? Ms. Jennings? Commissioner Fowler? Yes. Commissioner Van Yes. Commissioner Wise? Yes. Commissioner Yes. If you'd like to go ahead and, and tell about uh, the event. Thank you. So, of course, we'll be the first Friday and Saturday of June, as we always have been. We have an awesome lineup from all over that we'll be announcing next week. You'll look for that in the media and on social media. And as usual, we'll be keeping our focus on family fun events from the Ferris wheel to the inflatables to turtle races and even silent disco, something for all ages and talents. And we hope to have a couple new focuses we'll be pushing out soon for you to hear about from sustainability 
and accessibility. So we have some exciting new things this year. And we understand there's going to be kind of a Blue Plum West where the, the big yes. train show. I also. just had a meeting. Um, yes, we're going to, I work at ETSU as well, so that's kind of exciting that that ETSU piece is coming into Blue Plum. Uh, there's the train show that same weekend, and so thanks to the city, we're going to be working to have a shuttle, which will help immensely with Blue Plum parking on top of helping pull people between both events. So we've got overflow parking. We've got shade and air conditioning and free entry for kids to that train show. And that I'm really excited. I'm going to go to the train museum tomorrow for the first time with my nephews that are coming in town tonight. So we'll enjoy or it. Saturday, it's, Saturday. That's right. <laughs> it's really a special place. So what but exactly? it's, it's been exciting. I'm excited to direct. We had some amazing volunteers from the community to step up to help plan this and some awesome individuals and businesses to help sponsor it. And it's going to be a pretty fun event this year. What is silent disco? Oh, what is? Oh, you're going to have to come to find out. That's well, my challenge to you. So we have a DJ, and okay. you have headphones. And it's, it's just as fun to observe as it is to participate in. Actually, there's usually more viewers than participants. But you put the headset on, you're hearing the music. You can actually do multiple channels and do multiple DJs if you want to see something real weird with different sections of dancing. But it's kind of a quiet way to have another form of music in the park while having the live bands at the same time. So you're hearing the music. No one outside hears it, and you're dancing. I look weird enough dancing. <laughs> we, we welcome all forms of art. that variable <laughs> into the mix. But OK, I get it now. Thank you. Do everybody remember how Elaine danced on Seinfeld? That's kind of the way people look. <laughs> it's good. Um, so Let's see, is there a motion? We've, we've already done that. We've got another one coming up yes, that you're going to be here for. Street closures are okay, right Mr. Peterson. It's uh, consider approval of a street closure from the Blue Plum organization to accommodate the festival on Friday, June 1st, and Saturday, June the 2nd. This is the uh, usual areas. Uh, the reviews have been made, and the recommendation is for approval. Move approval. Second. Any further discussion? Um, Ms. Jennings? Yes. 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 You want to say anything about the street closures? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> They're the same as last year. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Next is consider approval of a street closure request from Blue Plum to accommodate the Blue Plum 5K and Little Plum race on Saturday, June the 2nd. Uh, this will be uh, street closure from 5.30 a.m. until 12 noon on Saturday. Following the course that's outlined in your packet, we would recommend approval. Is there approval. anyone here? Do you want... Oh, that's me too. I didn't yeah, remember. this is the 5K. Second. <laughs> okay, we, we already have a motion and, yes. and, a, and a second. So is there any other further questions you want to ask on the 5K? Okay, but it goes outside of the zone and it goes down... Slightly, yes. Yeah. yeah down Fairview, mm -hmm. Myrtle, Maple, back that way. Yes, and it'll be Saturday morning this time. Okay. What time does it start? I believe it's 10 a.m. Is oh. when the act, is eight. it nine? The yeah. registration starts at eight, Probably. but I think it's like a 9 a.m. Okay. race because you yeah, have the festival starts at 10. So. Very good. Okay. Uh, Ms. Jennings? Commissioner Fowler? Yes. Commissioner Van Brock? Yes. Commissioner Wise? Yes. Commissioner Brock? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you there. Your next order of business is consideration of the consent agenda. Commissioners, would you like to pull anything? Mr. Wise? No, ma'am. No, thank you. No, thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to pull two or three here. Um, I'd like to pull um, A1 on Carver, just to remind the public on that, A7 on MLK, MLK and A9 on our smoking resolution. So, Mr. Peterson, can you just give us an update um, on the carver and the splash pad over there, just mainly for the public I, I would love to ask Mr. Ellis to do okay. that, please, ma'am. <laughs> he, he will be better versed than I am. Or should we get you to do it? <laughs> Are you sure? Yes, we're very excited to ask your permission for consideration of applying for a TDEC grant to uh, construct a, a splash pad at Carver Recreation Center. This splash pad uh, in particular will be very similar to the one at Rotary Park. The major difference in this one versus the one at Rotary, however, will be that this will have a recirculating system installed. 
What is the timeline? Uh, the grant application is due April 18th. Have Mr. Lance Lowry here who is uh, submitting the grant on behalf of First Tennessee Development District for us and uh, staff has worked diligently to prepare the documents and we're optimistic we'll get the grant. Good luck and we'll look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, A7 is the next one. Uh, Mr. Peterson, could you kind of give us a uh, an overview again because we've had, we've had a couple of um, articles in the paper and um, uh, op-ed pieces on it and citizens calling to ask what happened. So if you could summarize that for us, I think that would be great for the public. Yes, ma'am. Uh, last fall, this body passed a resolution requesting that the state of Tennessee designate a portion of University Parkway in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, we forwarded that resolution to the, uh, our legislators and TDOT, and during their review of their request, they determined that uh, the section of University Parkway that we had requested had already been designated by the state of Tennessee as the Purple Heart Trail. Purple Heart Trail actually runs from Mountain City to Memphis, and it enters Johnson City on the four, from the four lane from Elizabethton down University Parkway to State of Franklin, where it turns left at the intersection of University Parkway and State of Franklin, and follows State of Franklin around to West Market Street, just right there next to the hospital. There it turns left and goes down 11E towards Greenville and various roads across the state of Tennessee to Memphis. And uh, they asked that we find another route or another road to recognize Dr. King with since that was already designated the Purple Heart Trail. Uh, so we regrouped, uh, researched to see what, uh, if there were any other conflicts with North State of Franklin Road. That was one of the original roads that was uh, involved in, in uh, the early discussions. So what we're asking you to do tonight is approve a resolution uh, to formally request the State of Tennessee to recognize State of Franklin Road from its intersection with the Bristol Highway over to its intersection with West Market Street in honor of Dr. King. This, this has, uh, the legislators have uh, worked with TDOT to verify that this doesn't have any conflicts. They have already begun the process of getting this into the, the necessary legislation to get this approved if you approve this resolution this evening. And this is a designation. It's not a name change of State of Franklin nor an address change. That is correct. The all, the, all of the uh, Parcels addressed off of State of Franklin Road will still be addressed off of State of Franklin Road and the, the uh, parcel identification number, your house number, your business number will all stay the same. Yes, And the official name that will be on the signs will be what? It is the Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Memorial Highway. Commissioners, anybody have any other comments or questions? Thank you. We'll vote on that in when we vote on the consent agenda yes, completely. All right. My last one is um, a resolution um, that was presented for our consideration from a number of public health entities. Um, and as we may know that the state of Tennessee has preemptive oversight in terms of determining um, smoking in public places. And so with our responsibility locally about protecting um, uh, our citizens, uh, we're requesting from the state legislature to allow the local bodies to regulate smoking in public places, and that's what this resolution is for. Um, particularly, we are seeing with the amount of activity we have in downtown and things in the pavilion and and um, uh, with large groups gathered that, um, you know, we can only regulate um, smoking in, internally inside buildings. But this is asking the state legislature to give us that 
uh, ability to regulate it publicly and do it locally. I don't have a copy of it. Oh, I'm sorry. Not in it's a fairly lengthy resolution because it gives all the history and background about the health, health um, uh, impact of secondhand smoke, and that's basically what this is about. Okay. You want to add anything to that, Mr. Peterson, uh, about what we face in public spaces and, and the complaints we get? Well, we, we do get a number of complaints about uh, uh, smoking on public property in, in uh, different public buildings. About the only place that we do have the authority to regulate are inside buildings uh, in closed spaces uh, and also on uh, school grounds. So, uh, you know, it, it does present a, uh, a challenge from a community relations perspective, a health perspective. Uh, and, uh, you know, while we're talking about uh, preemption of local control with smoking in this particular issue, uh, local control is a significant uh, topic of discussion with the state legislature. There are a number of things that uh, the state has uh, a tendency of, of stepping in and taking away local control or talking about taking away local control. Um, and I think all of you would uh, certainly agree with me that local control is, is best because you all see your constituents at, at the the grocery store at church walking down the sidewalk at dinner and you all have a better understanding and feel for the desires and beliefs of your community than a legislative body that's assembled from across the state and meets in nashville for three or four months a year uh, so i think it's uh, very appropriate to uh, consider and approve this resolution and to continue to make a firm stance that local control is best and that uh, control of, of issues needs to remain at the local level whenever possible. I think it might be um, nice if we kind of follow this resolution with a letter to our legislators and to really talk about some of the issues we're dealing with. And we have one in front of us right now, which is the farmer's market. And um, quite honestly, I've, I've and Ms. Cantler and I have talked about it. I mean, it's enclosed on three sides, even though the, the sides are open. But the density of people who, who are there at that time really makes it very problematic. So I'd like to explore to see if that can be classified as a quasi-enclosed area and go ahead and designate that as no smoking. Did you say a, an enclosed area? Well, that we we can regulate inside. Yes, ma'am. That you want us to consider that an enclosed area. An enclosed area. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Okay. Closed. We we will certainly do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> that was being nice. <laughs> All right. See any other questions or comments? I want to thank um, uh, Daniela uh, Davis, who is with Insight, who is a group who have worked with a lot of issues, public health issues. Um, who brought this to us and we're really glad to be able to move it through tonight. So I'll be very happy to vote for this one. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Any more discussion? Move approval. Second. This is for the consent agenda. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Jennings. Commissioner yes. Fowler. Yes. 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 Thank you. Our next uh, item of business is consideration of ordinance number 4658-18. An ordinance to amend Article 6, the historical uh, quarter overlay, historical conservation overlay district of the zoning code of the city of Johnson City, Tennessee regarding membership requirements. Uh, this ordinance uh, is uh, created for the city and the commission consisting of seven members who shall have a demonstrated interest, experience, or knowledge in historic preservation, are residents of the city of Johnson City at the time of their appointment, and who shall continue to so be eligible as long as they serve. Uh, 
that would be the change you now have. Uh, Jimbo, you have a song. There you are. I'm sorry. A it song. <laughs> Help me out here. <laughs> the significant, this is a change that you asked us to look yes. at uh, some time ago, and we're just now getting in front of you after going. So could you explain it, please, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, there were two main things that the Historic Zoning Commission and the Planning Commission were looking at following the recommendation that the City Commission had made, both in terms of the experience that any of these members can have and the residency requirement. Um, the Historic Zoning Commission looked at the state guidelines for membership in the Historic Zoning Commission and there wasn't that requirement for residency. So they thought it would be okay to do away with that particular requirement and just have something which resembles or quite closely resembles the state's uh, guidelines. So this is exactly what has been presented in front of you. Historic Zoning Commission recommended approval. Planning Commission is okay with it, and it's before you on consideration on first reading. Commissioners, is this what we, what your expectations were that would come back to us? And I voted for the last thing. You did. So, um, <laughs> Any, I think that's what comments? we were trying to okay. get done with this change. So, yeah. is there a motion then? Move for approval. Second. Okay. Any further comments? Ms. Jennings. Commissioner Fowler. Yes. Commissioner Van Brock. Yes. Commissioner Fly. Yes. Vice Mayor Brock. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Thank Hunter, you. for being here and the the zoning commission for going. I mean, the historical commission going back and looking at it this. Will require three thank readings. You. Yes. Your next ordinance for consideration is ordinance number 4659-18. An ordinance to amend title 11 of the code of the city of Johnson City to enact new provisions for camping on public property and repealing all ordinances and parts of ordinances in conflict herewith is ready for your consideration on first reading. Mr. Epps, please. Yes. Um, there have been some problems with people putting down bedding on sidewalks and in other places that are public. Um, I looked at it, I went to state law, and back in 2012, the state um, passed almost exactly the same law for um, their property, especially on the plaza, and there were folks that were bedding down there. And um, so I took their language, which their language doesn't apply to us, <laughs> and um, just made it apply to us. And so that's what you have before you is um, a law that says you can't bed down on public property. Does public property include the right of way or so that could be sidewalks and okay. <clears throat> Oh, yes, sir. Just for clarifi clarification, Commissioner, it includes but not limited to any public right-of-way, including sidewalks, public walking trails, public parks, except to the extent allowed in Title 20 of the code, the pavilion at Founders Park, Founders Park, and the pedestrian areas containing flood control measures bounded by Roan, King, Boone, Commerce, and State of Franklin Roads. So I think this uh, specifically identifies some areas, but the words including but not limited to is pretty much all inclusive of all public areas. Yes, sir. Any other questions of Mr. Epps? Thank you for working on this. I think, um, you know, we all know that, that um, we do have folks who are camping in our downtown with all their possessions and sleeping bags and all that, that kind of stuff and we would hope they would find um, an area that is more suitable for camping. So um, thanks for putting yes. this together. 
this would have three readings. So yes. we would yes. next consider that would, the third reading would be the first meeting of May. When would such an ordinance go into effect? Would it be? This, this ordinance goes into effect when it's published in the newspaper. This ordinance has a penalty attached to it. And our charter requires all ordinances with a penalty attached to it to be published in a newspaper of general circulation. And then we'll have public input on second reading? You don't have to on these ordinances, if you want it, certainly, but you don't have to. So you wouldn't do the public notice till the third reading, though, had been... There is no public notice required, and there is no public hearing required, but there is publication after it passes you all required, and then it'll go into effect. Third reading, right. Right. Okay. But you would, the public notice would occur after we passed it on third reading? Right, okay. right, that would be in the newspaper, okay. yeah. Move for approval. Second. Any further comment? Ms. Jennings. Commissioner Fowler. Yes. Yes. Commissioner Wise. Yes. Commissioner Frog. Yes. Thank you. Commissioners, that brings you to the end of your agenda items. Uh, one piece of information I, I would like to share with you today. Well, actually, two things. Uh, we received the three year work plan from TDOT today, which outlines the projects that they are recommending for funding in the upcoming state budget. Included in that three-year work plan is construction funding for exit 17 on I-26, which is the Boone's Creek Road interchange. Uh, that funding probably will not be available until October when the federal monies come through because this is a combination of state and federal money uh, anticipating a winter bid bid date with uh, probably construction starting about this time next year perhaps uh, so it, it's uh, long awaited very much appreciated uh, and so it's moving and we just need to be a little patient and give the state time to get the project bid, accept the bids, award the bid. Uh, and uh, like I say, to get through that process, we're probably looking at the spring of 19 start of construction, but that's, that's a real significant uh, bit of news. My understanding is that the duration of the actual construction will be significantly shorter than the gray interchange is do we have a sense of how long it's going to take once somebody's out there with a shovel in the I, ground i i do not i i would uh, uh i'll be glad to inquire of t dot for a, a best guesstimate and report that back to you but i i wouldn't begin to make a guess on that Will they manage the project or will yes, we are no, they going to ask it us is, to? it is a t dot project yes ma'am we we will have we will have some uh, probably some interaction there with utilities, but beyond that, um, it, it'll be a TDOT project. The other bit of news that we we sent you all a uh, a communication today, in uh, during our work to prepare to make the improvements to the walkway between uh, the parking lot and Main Street there between. Uh, next to the adjacent to the willow tree uh, our crews discovered that there was some structural issues with the wall that is adjacent to the etsu property and we had uh, a structural engineer look at that and their recommendation was that we close that walkway immediately until we had time to uh, get in there do some further evaluation and see what really needed to be done to uh, secure that wall and make repairs to it from the evaluation that has been made to this point we do not feel like there's any structural integrity issues with the etsu building uh, our facilities engineer was able to get a hold of the 1969 plans where the city built the wall up against the wall of the ETSU building. It's just that wall that was built uh, in 1969 that has the uh, structural integrity issues. So that walkway will be closed for some time. 
Uh, we've got barricades up. We uh, will have signage up indicating how to detour around uh, down by the old Hamilton Bank building to the other walkway uh, but, uh, that gets you over to Main Street. And as soon as we get uh, further evaluation and a suggested corrective action plan, we'll be back to you to report on that. Um, uh, this will be one of those unplanned, unexpected expenditures uh, that we will need to address in the upcoming budget process. So uh, good news is we found out about it before we had a significant problem. Uh, and hopefully it's something that uh, can be addressed fairly quickly and we'll have more information to you as we get it. Could we, uh, since there are so many activities downtown, just make sure how it's barricaded looks nice and the signage looks nice. And we, we spent about a half an hour this afternoon having those discussions. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things we talked about was the law enforcement and others need to be able to see into that walkway to ensure that someone hasn't gotten over there and to be able to see if there's trash accumulating and those types of things one of the things we talked about was perhaps putting a plywood face facing run street or main street and then working with a local artist or someone and having a mural paint on painted on it do something decorative uh, if nothing else, paint a brick wall on it like it was just a continuation of the business facades or something uh, to make it more attractive to Main Street and to also perhaps uh, discourage others from adding their artwork to the barricade. So, so the backside where... The back side of what we're talking about now would, was probably some sort of chain link fence something that you can see down the walkway and so we can keep an eye on it and make sure it stays secure. Um, once we get a corrective action plan put together, that's going to be a construction site. There will be people in there working every day and there will be the need to move heavy equipment in and out of that area uh, in order to do the work. Easiest way to impact how that looks is to get it done quickly. So, yes. I, so I hope that correction action plan will be to us quite promptly. Yes, sir. So I'm, I'm guessing too, there'll be disturbance to the downtown square parking lot with vehicles and... I'd, I'd, until we get the plan, I'd, I would be guessing, I mean, that's, uh, they're gonna have to go in there with some sort of man lift. I mean, that wall's 40 feet tall. So there, there will be some equipment that will enable workers to go up to that height to, to do work. That wall is just brick, though. There's nothing. That's correct. Not cinder blocks behind it. No, it, it is a. Uh, our best uh, guess, I guess, at this point, because we haven't opened the wall yet. That brick wall was put up with galvanized brick ties to an existing 18-inch thick masonry wall. Uh, we, we believe that what has happened, water has penetrated that wall and rusted those galvanized brick ties and they've let loose and it's just letting that brick. Uh, if you can envision, there are structural columns down there that used to support the roof deck on the covered walkway. The wall is actually leaning over up against one of those columns and uh, it's possible that that column is the only reason the wall hasn't already come down in that section. Ms. Cantler here, uh, you were going to be notifying the downtown merchants? Okay. We, we uh, early on this afternoon before we barricaded, we, we talked to the adjoining business owners, uh, sent a press release out, sent something to Diana, and she was going to communicate with all of her JCDA folks. else be glad to answer any question take any direction you may have for myself or the staff if there's any other comment mr wise i would just echo do it and do it quickly <laughs> on the project in the breezeway there's like i said we've already had a structural engineer look at it and they're still engaged to help us determine <clears throat> what the problem is and how to fix it 
Yes, sir. So that, that's already in process. Commissioner Brooklyn? Commissioner Fowler. Remember that King Commons opening tomorrow night at 530. That's right. So. 530, ribbon cutting. Ribbon cutting. Yeah. I, w I would like to just say one thing to, to our um, citizens of Johnson City. We have a big county election coming up. I guess uh, early voting starts April 11th. April 11th. And uh, we just need to remind everybody that all citizens of Johnson City are county residents. And so they need to go vote. Uh, it makes a big difference what happens in the county to us as uh, Johnson Cityans. So just want to encourage you to get out and vote and look for the best leaders you possibly can. So that's my two cents. Anything else? All right. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>